preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Helene Geismar Katz, and I'm the director of the Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the 92nd Street Y. It is my pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the Rothschild Lecture, endowed in honor of our esteemed honorary board member, Bessie Rothschild, and her late husband, Richard. We're just beginning our spring season and hope that you'll take a few minutes uh, to look over the catalog on your laps and see if any of our other lectures, uh, many of which are new since the last catalog, or any of our classes, our walking tours, bus tours, weekend tours, international travel, or anything else interests you. Also, if your New Year's resolution was to start an exercise program, we hope that you'll take a tour of our facility on the third floor. Our new cardio court brings you state-of-the-art equipment in a state-of-the-art facility. The newly renovated cardio fitness equipment area is just part of a multi-million dollar renovation project for our health and fitness center, and we really do think that you'll be pleased with what you see, so give them a call. And now for tonight's program. Our moderator for the evening is Jeffrey Kipnis, director of the Graduate Design Program of the Architectural Association of London, an Associate Professor of Architectural Theory and Design at Ohio State University. Mr. Kipnis is co-author of the 1992 book, Philip Johnson's Glass House, as well as articles in many architectural periodicals. He is partner in the design firm Sherdell Kipnis, located in the UK, whose recent work includes a master plan and urban design sequences for a new city in Hainan, China. Mr. Kipnis will be in conversation with our guest for the evening, Philip Johnson. Philip Johnson has played a pivotal, decisive role in defining American architecture in the 20th century. In 1932, Mr. Johnson, as founder and director of the Museum of Modern Arts Department of Architecture, the first such museum department in the United States, joined with architectural historian Henry Russell Hitchcock to mount a landmark exhibition entitled The International Style. He thus introduced a generation of American architects to this then revolutionary approach to, to design practiced by Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier. Mr. Johnson then created two of its most important monuments, the Seagram's Building in 1958 with Mies van der Rohe and his own Glass House. Well, 52 years after this historically critical exhibition, Mr. Johnson again transformed the architectural world with his design for the AT&T corporate headquarters in 1984. In 1994, Philip Johnson and his associates established the new architectural firm of Philip Johnson, Ritchie and Fiore Architects, whose current projects include a mixed-use office and retail building at Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin. The list of his books and honors could go on forever, but suffice to say that in 1993 alone, he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award of the New York Society of Architects and became a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a fellow of the American Institute of Arts and Letters. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Kipnis and Philip Johnson. Mics are on, you can. I got you. I want to introduce the introducer. Uh, <laughs> it's the most important part of the uh, performance is having somebody to, to give you a push, you know, and, and to sell the house before things get going. Well, I picked the best man in the world. He's a very close friend of mine. He is the most brilliant of all the architectural critics, historians, <laughs> teachers, speakers that I know of, although he's just a kid. But you watch, this man is going to be the, the, the leader of all criticism of, of architecture in the future. We're going to start him off tonight and see how good he is. Thank you. I've uh, 
been billed as the person that's going to be the leader of all architectural criticism in the future now for 15 years. So, I <laughs> uh, just want to tell you a little about what we try to do. Um, we used to, we meet quite frequently, and we look at materials. Sometimes his work, sometimes other architectures work, and, and we talk about it. And it's fun. And so occasionally we try to do this in public. And uh, when we do this, we studied the history of performance and theater and cinema, and we tried to develop a style. And after studying uh, cinema verite, we came up with a style called Neo Clumsy. And uh, <laughs> Neo Clumsy is very, it's a very highly choreographed and practiced activity where we look like we don't quite know what we're doing, the slides come on and off, and we don't, uh, we sort of make up stuff to say, and it's, you know, it's very carefully practiced, and it gives you the new sense of performance that's so crucial to contemporary architectural criticism. So I just want you to be, those of you that are kind of sure of performance, you're going to want to follow this as, as a matter of technique. Um, so anyway, we just, you know, like all architects and anyone in architects, we already think we know everything there is to know, and so we don't really prepare, and I just put some slides up and we talk. Um, <laughs> thank you. prepared, I'm not. A plant is always an important thing in an audience. So maybe we can look at uh, three slides. Actually, I'm supposed to have a button. I think this, oh, I bet that's it. You do? That looks like a button. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. No, we're we're going to come back. Oh. It, is, it looks like a button, but it isn't. All right. <laughs> well, you'd work, that was the light, obviously. No, no. No? Wait, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk to Philip for a second. This is not part oh, is of the choreography. A... Okay. Just getting Sorry. into the hall. Is it this call? Okay. Well, you got the button. Well, let's see. Okay. Can we have the lights, please? <laughs> so you want to turn around so you can see? Y'all okay. have to let me know if it's in focus or not. Um, so this is Philip Johnson's glass house. Um, in the, in the world of architecture, most of you know that Phillips, this was sort of the beginning and the end of his uh, serious significance in architecture. <laughs> very good. Sorry. He's a very good critic, um, isn't he? Okay, and so I thought it was always good to go back to it. Um, and so in a certain sense, he was a crucial figure historically for introducing modernism to the United States and as a founder of the... Uh, uh, as a founder of the, well, this is actually not that interesting. He found, you know, <laughs> but we have to kill 45 minutes. As a founder of the uh, architecture and design department of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, but for most people that are not uh, members of the architectural fraternity or community, I got it. And this is uh, the interior. And it's, also, it's backwards and it's uh, out of focus. They compensate. Um, for most people, though, they know Philip as uh, one of the preeminent figures in the postmodernism, which has revamped and revitalized or destroyed all the cities in the United States, depending on your position. <laughs> and uh, this, perhaps, is the most uh, familiar icon associated with him. And so I thought we would take a few minutes to talk about uh, what it was like, what, what kinds of issues took him away from his interest in modernism towards postmodernism, and in retrospect, uh, what, how he assesses that. So I'm going to bring the lights back up, and then we'll talk about that for a few minutes. And if you all want to stop, uh, ask a question at any time, speak up. And if not, there'll be a quick period of question at the end. So I take it you're, you're heading over there. I'm heading over where I can speak. Well, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just sit here. No, you're supposed to ask me questions. So. <coughs> I brought him along for support. He isn't doing much. So what took you from Mies to postmodernism? Yeah, what took me from Mies? That's a very interesting question. Boredom. Uh, <laughs> the point is the world's going along quite fast. And to have a style that is uh, strangling and uh, makes everything look the same uh, seemed a bit boring. And it did to me we are in a, in a period of rapid change. And why shouldn't architecture be in the same sort of a whirl? So when Bob Stern uh, suggested how boring uh, the black boxes were uh, all over the world, I couldn't agree with him more. 
and Mr. Anderul, my uh, guru, my leader, uh, the man to whom I'm, why I'm in an architecture at all, I learned that the Seagram building, of course, he, um, well, he started to bore me, Paul, as it were. Uh, and so when Bob Stern said I should be more modern, well, I decided, well, sure. Uh, I mean, if the world can change, I don't suppose I can change too. And so I got filled with boredom, and then we came to at t that wanted a building that was not like the Seagram building. They said, we do not want that building. And I said, I just happen to have here uh, <laughs> a new approach that I think you'll like. Well, they didn't know whether they liked it or not. I just did it. And, uh, and, and they bought it for some reason. And there it is. And that, of course, represents the other extreme. I thought <clears throat> that since we ought to button on to tradition in New York, that we better uh, use the great masters, McKinley and White, and, uh, and see what we could do with a tall building that, that McKinley and White wouldn't just laugh at. Well, I guess I better not go on in that room too long. <laughs> Did I do that? I tell you, this neo clumsy thing is really hot, isn't it? <laughs> I love words because neo-clumsy, you see, is a brand new word except uh, deconstructivism. Uh, and neo-clumsy comes out sounding fine. Better than neoplastic, anyhow. Or neo mies or neo corbusier Neo-clumsy, okay. Uh, so I was neo-clumsy all right at, this, at the at t building. What I didn't realize is that you cannot go with a fresh eye and understand uh, people like the McCabe Maiden White quite so easily. That takes, uh, you have to be McKim, you see. McKim knew in his period, in his guts, I didn't have that same gut. My guts are floating around in, in the Mies van der Rohe period. Uh, I'll never, never be able to get over it. And why should I? So I got uh, very annoyed with, uh, with postmodern. And which did it, which did it do, Kipnis? Did it make things infinitely worse? Or did it at least relieve the world of black boxes? Well, I think you said something that's even more to the point, and that is what role architecture has in participating in, in producing interest in boredom. Because generally, interest in boredom belong to notions like fashion, to, to style, to the fashion industry. And it's also been at least the, the conceit of architects that fashion doesn't belong in and to architecture, that architecture should resist the mechanisms of fashion and look for more timeless conditions. Uh, what I think postmodern did, Nism did, was finally prove that what architecture was nothing more than, but nothing less than, one of, culture, one of the cultural forms of fashion. And in that sense, it looks just completely out of fashion right now, but we can also expect, I think, it to come, you know, you know, the bad thing about, you know, you have an out of fashion outfit or a double breasted suit, you put it in the closet. On the other hand, we have to sit here and look at this building, you know, all the time. So this here is this problem with, you know, architecture and fashion. Shoot, I don't think he likes my building. Well, I like it when the smoke comes out the top. Wasn't that great? The last few days it's been modern. Do, do y'all know that there's smoke that comes out of the top of the AT? That's not smoke. No, I'm sorry. That's con condensate. Steam. Steam, whatever it is. Condensate. Yeah. Uh, but you know, then it was intentionally designed to have this kind of uh, ghostly Mostly. atmosphere of smoke come out of the Chippendale top. They all know that, and it's not Chippendale. I don't know that. You don't know. Did you know that? No, I'm sorry. That's uh, it's Shoot, true. I designed it for the stuff to come out well. It, it, today has been a wonderful day to look at it. Uh, I'm going to show the next well, slide. No, you brought up a, a very important point which has to go on with, and that's fashion as the basis of architecture. I think probably uh, you'd find that Zemper would agree, uh, the great theoretician of the 19th century, who said that uh, architecture is the dress of construction, <clears throat> like clothes. Uh, one Viennese architect used the phrase of his exhibition, heavy dress. And that's all architecture is. Architecture is fashion on a, we like to think, uh, 
higher, deeper level than clothes, but is it? Why not? Why isn't clothes extremely much exactly like, uh, like architecture? It changes. It doesn't change fast. Architecture changes slower, maybe, than fashion. On the other hand, nowadays it almost seems to go faster. But if you take fashion as the basis for architecture, instead of the ultimate truth of classicism, or the ultimate truth of construction, the ultimate truth of functionalism, uh, the ultimate uh, truth, as uh, Plato would have it, of, of beauty with a capital B. But it's a fashion, and as such, <clears throat> the bases are the bases of fashion are unknowable. But it is a basic desire of the human creativeness to want to do a little bit something else, and uh, we don't have an easiest time of it as the rest of the world in fashion, because in, in architectural fashion, as he says. Kipnis said it's going to uh, be there for a long time. You have to be a little more careful than the fashion designers can be. But if you think of the analogy to fashion uh, as the basis of architecture, you'll be closer to it than the people that believe in the eternal verities with a capital V. You agree? Yes. He does. Lights uh, down. I, I want to. Lights up. Down. Down. Oh. I want to ask you a little bit about technique. I want to show a project which I think is interesting to think about in your lineage of work, if I can find it. This is a, just one shot from a project you did for, Seat, for Seton Hall Hill? Seton Hill. Seton Hill uh, uh, Women's College. Now I think it's a really interesting project because it seems to me transitional between, between your direct interest in the, the historical quotations of postmodernism, but it also is just beginning to start to show some interest in the kind of clutter and uh, non-ordered um, organizational attitudes of deconstructivism. So on the one hand, it looks a little bit like a quote from a Tuscan village. On the other hand, it begins to suggest another idea. And so I was wondering if, that, if you agreed with that assessment of it. And in a second, I want to ask you about how you designed it. Because, I might as well show you this, it looks like you designed it by copying this project by Frank Gehry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll just run this back one time. I don't so think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's absolutely accurate. <laughs> of course I designed it with Frank Gehry in mind. Uh, Frank Gehry is the most original uh, architect of our time. And uh, I don't claim the originality, I claim uh, that I'm uh, struggling along in the fashion uh, of a good practitioner, and that this little village of mine uh, was a very good piece. Incidentally, I think my tower, uh, the, the, the pyramidal thing I built, is more interesting than his, although he, <laughs> Yeah, but wait a minute, he's asymmetrical. He went one more step than I did, you see, although I copied it from him. In other words, I don't my, all learn my lessons quite as well as I might. But you're right, it's a halfway between a Tuscan village uh, and Frank Gehry. And, and why not, indeed? Uh, <laughs> if a fashion person can put on a dress uh, with little new twists to it that gave it character from another period, uh, he would. If they're not able to, they aren't smart enough to do it, that's all. Okay, let's go on. Just, uh, just, for, his, <laughs> just for historical accuracy, um, <laughs> this, this Frank Gehry is, was done at the Witten House, Witten House, which was actually the original house you built, you designed. The so, Winton House I built, yeah. Okay. This is an addition, so this is an to, addition my to a house that Philip built. So I suppose he's, he claimed from that the right to copy the project. Well, Frank... Um, but that's the second of the, let's say, the canonic virtues of architecture. One is that it remains aloof from fashion, and second, that the architect is a source of originality, and that the idea, the very idea that an architect would derive his work from other architects so conspicuously, yet again, is an assault on at least the canonic traditions of architectural value. So in five minutes, we find you praising fashion and praising copying. And uh, we, you know, I kind of wonder. You mean Calvin Klein doesn't copy Armani? <laughs> Excuse me, of course they copy. 
They copy all the time. Never mind, go on. What were you talking about? That's very well, interesting. I'm just, I, if you were to list all of the virtues that architects at least would like to claim yeah. in the mythology of architecture yeah. for their own role and their task, I think your career looks like a systematic assault on those virtues. Hmm. Um, it's, it, it embraces fashion, it embraces copying, it has no problem taking the hard-earned, uh, difficult achievements of research and design and then selling them to corporate um, clients for the purposes of increasing their visibility. So Gee, I'll, is that me? I think that's one of them. Uh, <laughs> it's prose I've been talking all this time. Huh? Uh, but, uh, well, that's fine. Well, let's look at some more pictures. Right. Because right after that project, you really, you curated the deconstructivist show, co-curated it with Mark Wigley, and um, essentially created a kind of scandal uh, of two sorts. One is, it looked as though you were taking work of a very esoteric character and uh, forcing it into a pseudo character, a pseudo, um, category, deconstructivism, what did that possibly mean? As it connected constructivism and deconstruction in some way, but at the same time, is it really true that uh, Peter Eisman and Rem Koolhaas and Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid have anything to do with each other? But worse than that, you started to lift some of the techniques from deconstructivism and incorporate them into your own design, or better than that. And so I thought we would look at one of those projects and ask you to comment on it, if I could get this thing to go. Where do I point? <laughs> Just into the abstract, maybe it'll work. But wait a minute, let me go get the guy. Go ahead. Go ahead. How can I go ahead and no picture? Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, you aimed it right. Something. I got it. It's up there. Okay, so this is uh, the Saint Basil Church in Houston, and basically you take a Byzantine, the abstraction of a Byzantine form and then you ram this black slab right through the middle of it. <laughs> Is that to increase its, let's say, its liturgical stature? No, oh, goodness <laughs> sake. You make this into a, into a big story. All I wanted to do, was, these, are my, these are my walkways on each side of the campus, and I wanted to connect the end of this long, long campus, uh, which I copied, by the way, from a man named Jefferson, which noble thing to copy. Uh, and then I deliberately take old and new and mix them, uh, uh, praying that a nice mix will come out of it. Uh, so that granite wall is the only uh, superior uh, part of the construction. The rest is just stucco, a stucco box. And then we got somebody to go leaf the dome, which is uh, a marvelous idea. That's white there. This shows the light coming through at night. Uh, the dome is, is off center, and oh, there it is, gold. And uh, but Philip, that is it's disingenuous to talk about um, those kinds of effects, pleasantries. Yeah. When in fact, it's an extremely violent and aggressive formal act. Doesn't look formal act and doesn't look aggressive to me. I just came. Look, look. But I did look up answer. there. <laughs> Now let me ask you something. If I asked you what was the birthday cake and what was the knife, would you have <laughs> would you have difficulty figuring that out? Now you make fun of me, isn't that great? <laughs> Every, everything that's any good has to make a joke about. Not you can't make lots of jokes about this. Why is it? Why is the sacred dome cut in half? It's terrible. I did that, of course, for light, but. Uh, you're telling me you, you cut this dome in half with a black slab just to let light in. Okay. Listen, I, mean, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know I believe you. I definitely believe you. I don't know why I did. <laughs> so anyway, you flirted with deconstructivism for a while, did some projects. And then I believe that this is probably both the best of all the projects that were informed by deconstructivism the last one you did, and also the most perverse. Uh, this is the Puerta del Europa, and it's in Spain. Madrid. Yes, and Madrid's in Spain. I, I wasn't wrong. <laughs> I was working my way there. Good. 
And I've always found this project incredibly perverse because you take one of deconstructivism's most aggressive tactics, and that is the tilting off the orthogonal. And then you use it by mirroring it symmetrically to reinforce a dominant axis in a city, which of course is one of the, one of the kinds of organizational effects architect traditional architecture um, deployed that deconstructivism was most interested in uh, disestablishing. So you steal from one an effect which belongs to one kind of architecture, and then you place it, uh, let's say, non-traditional, and then you place it in the service of the most traditional kinds of architectural effects. And then you, then that's it. That's the end of Johnson's deconstructivist architecture. Well, there's very simple reasons for that. Uh, I was following the trend of my own thoughts, and we were given the job of, of making these two monuments flanking uh, the biggest avenue in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, so we, uh, we did it. Now, by leaning them, it just emphasizes the, the archway, the Arc de Triomphe-ness uh, of the thing. That's, a, that's part of the, you see, architectural critics can have fun any way they want, but we had a building to build. We had a man. <laughs> Architects uh, have to mix everything because they have to apply it uh, to a job that you can get uh, reasonably reimbursed for it. Uh, a sore subject with architects. And uh, so we, um, I took a theme. This theme does not come from deconstruction. It comes from Rodchenko, uh, the uh, constructivist uh, artist of uh, Soviet Russia, who had that, uh, that angle that you see, the sharp angle, I took from a drawing, a sketch by Rodchenko. Uh, the idea of going off. Now, I don't know whether that's deconstruction or a little bit of, of constructivism being imitated. Uh, I don't mind at all. The word deconstructivism, like all words, is very silly. But if I didn't, if we hadn't, we, because there were a lot of us in on this plot, uh, if we hadn't picked a silly word, nobody would remember that exhibition. Nobody came. It's 1988. And it, it was in a little tiny room at the Modern. And no one noticed it, but now, of course, everybody knows Decon. And we all dip into it, as uh, Kipnis says. But uh, you dip in different ways. I dip in a way that is uh, perhaps influenced by pretty pictures in history books. Uh, constructivism was very close to the hearts of each one of these people. Each one of these people that I talked to before the show opened admitted that Malievich uh, and Rochenko were the two uh, people that they watched all the time that they loved looking back to. Well, so I put a lot of constructivist uh, architecture into the entrance of deconstructivism to uh, puff up the show. But in other words, each one of us picked different things from that show. In fact, nobody's in a straight line from this show, are they, Kipnis, except no. perhaps, yeah. Uh, Zaha maybe a little bit. No, Zaha and more uh, Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Pricks. Pricks. Yeah, but even now he's starting to. Who? A, Wolf Pricks is starting to get into kind of gooey form. He's getting the gooey form. He'll well, we'll look at gooey form in a minute. He'll get to the gooey form. I mean, there's two things you've said that are interesting. Um, one is, I think it's very interesting to hear an architect refer to his fee as a reimbursement. Um, That's what? I missed very, that. Very telling. You refer to your fee for this project as a reimbursement. Um, but that's okay. It's another thing. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> the, um, what I think, I think this is, in, in all honesty, a really remarkable project because it uses a decidedly contemporary gesture, but also borrows very strongly from grand arch techniques yeah. to create Broke. something which is both, in a sense, disturbingly contemporary. It's a montage, in a sense. It's a cinematographic effect, I believe, of a very traditional organization and attitude about the axis. In a very, also in a very de contemporary deployment. So I believe it. I believe it's one of your most interesting projects since AT and T. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, in a sense, I was surprised to having gotten this far with the idiom that you then immediately abandon it. Um, in fact, let's take a look at where you go. Did I abandon? Hmm. Well, your next project. You better go and ask him again. Well, here it is. Uh, that's not your next project. No. Actually, at this point in the conversation, I was going to talk a little bit about Terry Riley's show, but maybe we'll just skip that. We can uh, come back. We to can it. come back to it. Yeah. Uh, this is Herzog and <coughs> I, have to, I always call it manure. Herzog manure. and Demuron. Demuron. 
sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is Rem Coolhouse. Well, maybe we'll come back to it. But after the Puerta del Europa, uh, Philip started some, he was, I think he was interested in this project by Peter Eisenman, which is a high, the Max Reinhardt House in Berlin. It's basically a high-rise building, uh, proposal for a high-rise in Berlin. Is that focus? Um, I have control of focus, but you know, you do? my eyes are just gone. Oh, you improved it. You is, improved that it. it. is that good? Oh, much better. Okay, tell me. Uh, and then not only th this project, but uh, the concert focus. hall. This is definitely not focused. It's part of uh, the Other technique. Way. There you go. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, the Disney Concert Hall. So I think, in part inspired by this, and we haven't figured out what to call it. I mean, we have call it liquid form and gooey form. It's definitely different from deconstructivism. In a certain sense, most critics are, trying, are inclined to call it new expressionism, and I think there's a real problem with that. I was very interested to notice that uh, Herbert Mooshamp has decided to avoid that trap and start referring to all these projects as a kind of new surrealism. I think that was in the paper two or three weeks ago. And I think that's, a, that's an improvement over recasting this as expressionist or neo-expressionism, but I don't know that it's surreal uh, in the sense, in the historical sense. But this kind of struggle of what to call this kind of architecture has been plaguing in, uh, critics and writers. Um, doesn't seem to have stopped the architects from doing it. And um, Philip has his first effort. So what is this, Philip? Focus. focus it. Come on, guys. How do you focus something like that? You did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that close? Not much, no. Never uh, mind. It does matter. It's a funny looking building anyhow. That's as good as I can do. So uh, what is it? Well, now this is a very loaded question on his part. He hates this building. And uh, that's all right. Most people do. And uh, they persuaded me that it was a, a wrong direction. But uh, we, the sense of freedom went to our heads. There's Frank Gehry was the leader in this particular venture. Uh, this was a design for a house by Frank Gehry, no, of an addition to a house that Frank Gehry was in the middle of designing. This is his, his complex. You see what fun he was having with so the, the all time. that stuff on the left is Frank's and then this one is that building on yeah. the right. And uh, so I was, and he thinks this is a glorious little addition to his uh, buildings. But uh, what's lacking is I'm now from criticizing my own buildings because I'm, I'm into this work. And there is no architectural uh, backbone to it. It's, uh, it really is gooey. And it, it doesn't have any, in other words, it isn't architecture. It's uh, playing with the sugar cake. And, and, uh, and the, uh, the, what got me mad at it, at this direction, was the fact they couldn't build it. <clears throat> there's no way to measure it. There's no way to give it any, any handle on it, what it is. Uh, there's no heiress. That's an important word which you'll hear a great deal from now on in architecture. If, can we go back to, to the uh, to Gary's building, the big sure. building? Yeah. You can? Yep. No, back. Yeah, that, no. I mean the Gary's, concert hall? Yeah. You're going to tell them about Aris's? Yeah. Just wait till later you can tell them. I want to tell them about your building. Oh, when I get to my own area. Yeah, we don't want to be yeah. talking, oh. but this is not Frank. Anyhow, uh, this looks like chewing gum now to me. I mean, this is what, what the objection was to what the Germans called expressionism in the, uh, after the First World War. And uh, they didn't go on with it either uh, because it, it's a dead end. Uh, you can't build it, and uh, you can't use it for permanent buildings. And it, it gave a sense of freedom, all right. But it, uh, it wasn't an architectural direction. On the contrary, on the opposite argument that what today Peter uh, Eisenman and Frank Gehry are doing are very clearly structural. That skyscraper in Berlin that uh, Kipnis just showed you is very clearly buildable, very clearly uh, faceted to give you a sense of scale. And that wonderful idea of putting a, a hole in a skyscraper is uh, beautifully managed. I still hope it can be built. 
But the same thing in Los Angeles. There's trouble getting that building of Frank Gehry uh, built. The, the budget got a little bit high. Uh, you know, um, I'm gonna, I want to show the audience two things. About, first of all, I'd like the audience to remember this building because in maybe five slides, I'm going to show you. I believe that this is one of the ugliest works of architecture I've ever seen. <laughs> I really hate this. What and, you should uh, say is not architecture. I'm, As chewing in, gum, it's very interesting. In three slides or four slides, I, is the development from this first uh, inve adventure into gooey form where, and I think Philip ends up with one of the most beautiful works of architecture I've ever seen. So I, I think it's important to just sort of pay attention to how quickly he masters some ideas. But even in this one project, if you look at the proportions on this, this was the first sketch. This was the first effort. And, uh, and then if you, look, if you look at the last effort, it's taller and thinner and even more elegant. You, I, it's inelegant in the beginning and inelegant in the end, but this kind of compulsion on Philip's part to continuously make the work elegant, and essentially to refine it, even to the point of overly refining it, is extremely interesting to me. And so no matter how clumsy this is, and I still find it clumsy, it's, it's clearly better than the last. I mean, do you think so? I, I'm going to have to, I could, it's amazingly better in its badness than the first version. <laughs> so how did you know that, Philip? It's how did better, you know that this was bad? It's better anyhow. This is Casper the Friendly Ghost, right? <laughs> uh, and it became much clearer that the spirit of, of ghostly uh, appearance, construction, let's call them, to avoid architecture, uh, it's far superior, that's all. When you find you're working in models only, you can't make a drawing of this building. Uh, that you have to improve it. it. It just doesn't come out the first time. And so we went to work at it. That's just a normal thing well, that every I mean, Did you look does. at 10 different versions and decide that taller and thinner, or did you think, no, this is too squat, and what I need this to do too is... too squat, I need some, some dignity to this So all thing. of your proportional thinking is just by eye? Of course, so is everybody's. You don't use any kind of geometry, any there kind of proportional... There are no geometries. That's the first thing, dear Dr. Kipnis. We have to get rid of geometry. We've got to get rid of Euclid, we have to get rid of Plato, we have to, to use the fact that the world is unknowable, we use the facts that we all know now, that the unpredictability, the whimsicalness of the universe. Uh, even the physical scientists are learning that. So let's leave our Plato behind. And now, incidentally, we leave our T-squares behind. Uh, the, the, the fundamental way an architect works today is uh, with, with two tools, uh, the clay model, which you usually throw away three quarters of the first ones, uh, then you go on from there, and the other thing is, of course, the computer. Of course, there's only two people I know that do that. That's, I mean, actually, there's only one architect I know that uses the clay model. Who's that? That's Philip. And now, of course, it's the way that all architects work. Um, oh, didn't. Well, I say, we. I say we because there are five or six in this country that work that way. And uh, actually, uh, Kipnis has um, thought of a, of a very good word for this, which I don't know, he's not seemed to wanting to reveal it, but this whole thing that we're six or eight of us into, uh, he has named wanton architecture. It seems to be very apt. In other words, wanton is one of those uh, envelope words that uh, doesn't make, isn't as bad as deconstructivism, which is what the hell Derrida was talking about. <laughs> uh, we don't know what it was, but wanton architecture is a nice, loose, catch-all phrase, and it is wanton. I mean, it, it's, it's humorous, it's uh, vicious, it's... Uh, Excessive. Uh, it's what? Excessive. Excessive. Go ahead, some more words. <laughs> Never mind. Um, how about some more pictures? <clears throat> you do? Now, this is going to look like a ringer in the middle of the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, is a... Berlin. Tell them what this is. This is your Berlin... This is my biggest job since... Uh, in the last decade. It's, it doesn't look big, but it's a huge, huge job in the middle of Berlin, uh, a point called Checkpoint Charlie uh, that you may have heard of. And my friend, uh, Mr. Lauder of, uh, you know, the company, Estes Company, uh, bought the center of Berlin, the largest piece uh, that anybody owns. And uh, we wanted to build an, a name building, a distinction building. Well, we started out all right. But this is what we ended up with because 
of the laws in Berlin. They insisted on a certain height, a certain proportion of glass, a certain uh, pitch to the top of the building uh, until our hands were completely tied, and that's the best we could do. So now we want to show you what I was really working on at the time. <laughs> and I, t I told the Berlin audience first about this, that uh, this is what I would build if I had my druthers and you people leave me alone. You have to know that he went to Berlin to give one of the most prestigious architectural lectures at the invitation of uh, the building director of Berlin's name is Dr. Stimmen, who's essentially been the person who's single-handedly responsible for reinstituting all of the design codes um, that cause these kinds of buildings to be built. The goal is to restore build Berlin to its uh, late 19th and early 20th century character. So, so he built, uh, Philip actually designs, you know, because he's a client, builds the building, then goes to give this lecture. And what he does at the lecture is chastises Stimmen for forcing him to build this building, <laughs> and then says this is the one he would like to build if it wasn't for people like, uh, I always wanted to create a scandal. But you can already begin to see <laughs> the increasing elegance in the form. And um, it's on that note I'd like to show you what you probably have already seen before. And that's this incredible building at the New Canaan, at the Glass House in New Canaan. It's been published a lot. Uh, it's absolutely impossible to go see because it's a private property. And David Whitney will be quite upset at my saying this, but if you go up on Wednesdays like with $10 and you pay the, uh, pay the groundkeeper, you can go see it, and I recommend it. <laughs> um, and it's you'll an all be thrown out at once. It's an absolutely, it's a thrilling experience, I think. To, and I'm, I'm so astonished at how, I mean, he calls it the, the uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost. For me, that building looks like a giant albino octopus, the, the one I showed a few minutes ago. On the other hand, this is in every way the kind of elegance that form can achieve with spectacular effects, shadow effects, the rain falls off of it in the most astonishing uh, twist and surprising sprays. So it shows what this kind of form can do other than look idiosync idiosyncratic. And so I was thought I'd show you a few pictures of it. Now, the most intelligent thing is that there's two lobes, one red and one black. And so as you walk around it, because of the highly variegated form, every view changes. And so it looks like one building, a red building, then it looks like a black building, and then it looks like a collage between the two. So it's an, ast it's an astonishing visual effect. In fact, it's a kind of uh, concretized ecstasy. And what I think is very intelligent about this building is, is that it's the only one on the property which is sided so that you can't see the glass house, which in a certain sense is physicalized repose, and uh, uh, whereas this is a physicalized um, frenzy. Um, <laughs> so you can't see the glass house from here, and you can't see this from the glass house. So it's an astonishing bit of siding, which I, sh I think shows an amazing intelligence on Philip's part. On the other hand, he's so greedy for his own work, he's now deciding to cut the trees down, <laughs> which block the two from each other. So perhaps you could encourage him to, to not to make that fatal mistake. Uh, these are the interior shots. Now, on the outside, you see the black and the white, but you can tell from this shot that on the inside, this neutral gray turns it into one cavernous monolith. So there's a real shock when you, on the outside, you expect two completely distinct kinds of spaces. On the inside, there's one. Also, the poche, the thickness of the walls, makes the interior volume different from what you would expect on the outside. So there's a real change of space and a real shock in, of your expert expectations when you walk from the outside of the building to the inside of the building. Maybe you can tell them a little about the heiresses that you were going to discuss. I'm sorry you left out the picture of the other room. You say there's one room, there are two. There are two rooms. Yeah, one in the black but and one in the red. But they're connected in a way that, that it doesn't yeah. look like there would be the, what you no. would expect, two completely distinct rooms. This is what, what, when you hit a piece of architecture the way I hit here, I mean, this is, it excites me more than any build I ever built. Uh, and I think it is but the best building I've ever built. For instance, I'm asked now, 
uh, if you had to tear down either the glass house or this building on your property, which one would you keep? Well, simple to me, this one. But of course I'm wrong. Everybody considers the glass house uh, <laughs> nice and old fashioned and cute looking now, 50 years later. Uh, at the time when I built the glass house, it was booed. The editorial and the local paper said, if Mr. Johnson has to make a fool of himself, why didn't he do it in someone else's town? Uh, <laughs> and when I built this, nobody said anything. Although this is far more radical, far more uh, destructive uh, than that building is. But this is my passion. This is what <clears throat> architecture is all about, to make a great many mistakes in your life, but to hit, uh, and as I turn 90, uh, it gives me a new, a new kick in life. All my work now <clears throat> looks like this. I'm doing a clock in front of Lincoln Center. What do you suppose a clock looks like? <laughs> well, you'll see it, I hope. And uh, this is the kind of work uh, that I want to be known for. I admit, it's a little wee tiny bit expensive. <laughs> like double. But uh, that's because all the techniques we used <clears throat> to build it, it's extraordinary shape are new. It's concrete building, and it, it's such a friendly shape that uh, I call it my monster, because M-O-N-S-T-A, because uh, it's a nice, big, friendly whatever. It, uh, it would be like a horse if it were the right size, but it's too big. So I go and I pat it there on the side and the flank, <laughs> uh, the way you would a friendly, a friendly, great big animal. If you see a horse, if any of you people are horse people, you, you know what you do, you see a horse, you grab him by the bridle and you pat his flank. Everyone does it, you can't help it. Same with this house. I've seen perfect strangers to me without a word of introduction come up and feel the building. And of course it is so hard, it just kicks you right back. Uh, and it looks soft and inviting, it isn't. It's marvelous and, and monumental. But the big surprise, my friends, is what I can't understand. How can you make a piece of sculpture? You don't know what the inside of it's going to look like. You can't possibly see. Show us the inside again, can you? I'm fine. Oh, it goes around there somewhere. OK. And uh, the inside, to me, is, uh, gives me a feeling in the pit of my stomach that no space I've ever done uh, does. Uh, and this comes around and encloses you and monumentalizes your feeling so that you a oh, feeling of awe, I don't know, I don't care the name of the feeling. There's the other room. Oh, good, you found it. And uh, this is the inner room, as it were, where we're going to show slides. And uh, that room is even more like a, uh, a chapel or something, sacred space. You lower your voice. You, uh, you look around you. You can stand or sit, and, and you feel good. Well, I don't know what you call it. A lot of people say it's sexual in the feeling they get. Other people say if, if they are religious, which I'm not. Uh, that it's a religious feeling you get there. Uh, I judge people's reaction, for instance, by whether they have glistening eyes when they get through looking at it. I don't care what they say, if they're actually moved or not. Uh, we do have one problem. You may have noticed it already, is the holes. How do you put wood? <laughs> I now have to do a house. Somebody got crazy about the design and wrote me, let's build a house like this. Well. Uh, that's nice to have that kind of space, but it would be nice to look out uh, from the living room. Uh, so I'm a little bit perplexed what to do there. It's really true. I mean, you, I think you solved every problem, but how do you poke a hole in it? Um, well, but that is a basic problem. Because it looks like sort of Cabinet of Caligari holes in a completely Cabinet different... Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is where I got the holes, yeah. But the best... uh, I think you were quite intelligent in how few you put in it. Well, I kept them down, down all right. I mean, there's only one. Well, yeah. One so. window and one door. <laughs> it's not so bad. Anyway, that's our slides. Um, so if you'll bring the lights up, we'll just let Philip take uh, questions from the audience. I already have. <laughs> <laughs> we, told, we said we talked for 45 minutes? We're, we're past it's, 45 minutes. Well, let's stop it right now. No, no, Thank no, no, you. No. What? <laughs> See, people are leaving. Questions, anybody? Did you think of putting glass on the top of his house? Yes. So that you wouldn't be disturbed. You would have the feeling that you have, and then you could. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright did it in a couple of churches, and you look up and you see the heaven. I'm doing a church right now, and I'm doing exactly that, sir. Uh, but I'm finding that this kind of an approach 
It's very difficult to do at huge scale. I have an enormous church, 2,500, 3,000 seats. And of course, to make that look like that room, which I naturally started, doesn't work. But uh, naturally, that was my whole thought, that all the, uh, the light came with color, perhaps, down through deep holes in the ceiling. You must be an architect, yeah. What do you believe is the most important factor in taking a concept and materializing it? Wait, I got, I'm sorry. she asked, uh, what is the most important factor in taking a concept, taking a concept and materializing it? <laughs> I wish, I wish I knew I'd do it again. That's the trouble is how much luck, how much artistry, how much stupidity, uh, how much is just plain money help in the, in the thoughts to develop uh, from a concept into a building? It's I, can I say something about that? You know, naturally. Sorry. I mean, his answer is always uh, more valuable, but i tell you what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've made a really bad mistake for 400 years, and that's to think that ideas are more important than material form. And so we're constantly trying to obligate the materialization to the idea when in fact material form in architecture and art is so excessive that it leaves the idea behind. In a certain sense if you just get the idea in the form you have a cartoon and we see that all over the city. We see buildings that are designed that are really just one liner, one idea, one cartoon. If you pay very close attention to the material effects, the formal effects, the color effects, it leaves the idea behind in a dramatic way. So I think a good thing for us to do as a culture is to, is to let go of this notion of the supremacy of the idea or the concept. That's my opinion. And think more of the primacy of art. Over here? As an inexplicable thing. I mean, why is Cezanne a great painter? Well, don't try, because you can't. And uh, in other words, art is what it is. It's, it's its own form of reference. You don't need to have the basic ideas behind it, which is what Hitchcock and I and you and a few wise I mean, ideas critics. get you started, but you just you have to leave them behind. They're dime a dozen. I mean, I think that's probably an accurate value. Eight point whatever that comes at eight cents a piece. Do you think, she's asked, uh, in, to your eye, do you see this as being closer to Frank Gehry than Le Corbusier? Oh, my yes. But to your eye, you do. That similarity? But you know, there's, the, there's late Corb, you know, the Philippus Pavilion. There's, there are late projects by Corb where, that look more like this. No, the late projects by Corb are still all mathematics. That, uh, that thing you've been talking about in Brussels, I guess. The Phillips, uh, yeah. uh, Phillips yes. Uh, it's all very hyperbolic, paraboloid, uh, figuring with a mechanical thing. Right. But this isn't. This is seat of the pants, wanton architecture. That's why he uses the word wanton, you, uh, just exactly because it isn't geometry. Because they look like wontons. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? In the red shirt? I got you. That's a very good question, and I wasn't thinking of grandfather clocks, nor was I imitating Chippendale desks. I was, uh, what I actually picked it up from was a church in Ephesus of uh, Hadrian time, period of Hadrian. Uh, the great period of architecture in classical time wasn't Greece or Rome, it was the Asia Minor. And uh, I think the, the idea of taking a, a pediment and doing that is a very, well, it's perfectly obvious. Way. How are you going to crown a thing like this? You can do it with an acroteria uh, on the center gable, or, or you put a circle there. It seems like such an original thing that, to give it the name of Chippendale or something exotic is totally unnecessary. What I really did it for, though, was so you'd see the building. So you'd see, I know that building, that's the Chippendale building. I didn't, I didn't know what you people were going to call it. It's the same thing with the lipstick building. It's what? Lipstick. The, the, lipstick. the lipstick building. 
which you're all familiar with maybe. Uh, I had no idea what, you, what people were going to call it. But now the official name is, is getting to be Lipstick because that's the name of the, of the restaurant on the ground floor because people call it the Lipstick Building. People could find that. You can't find 885, whatever it is, uh, 3rd <laughs> Avenue. You, you don't even get the, the official name is 53rd at 3rd. Well, who cares? It's the Lipstick. <laughs> Thank goodness people give names to buildings that stand out good or bad. I'm not saying now my architecture is good or bad, but the standing out part, I knew the AT&T wanted. The, the head of AT&T was a very uh, de deliberately tough guy. I remember in the meeting one day, he said, hey, you all like this one? Uh, it was dead silence. And he said, isn't it one would have you all so unanimous? <laughs> <laughs> they all hated it, you know. There's a question. Did you still want to answer? Yes. Yes, you. Yes. It's a magnificent piece of sculpture. Thank you. Can you explain to me where sculpture and practical applications When does, yeah, in architecture, where does sculpture end and, and the practical responsibilities? Let's ask the intellectual in the group here. Then she asked you. I mean, I, I would like to answer this, but unfortunately she asked you. Why? Just. <laughs> Just because I'm built here? Now that isn't, that's the way well, you You've got to tell her what you really think, and that is architect, really, the thing that ruins architecture is all this practical application stuff. <laughs> <laughs> See, I couldn't say that. Uh, I'm a good architect and I'm looking for jobs. I have very little work. And if I look for jobs and say, I'm going to give a damn whether you want a bathroom or not, you can't have one. That wouldn't sound, <laughs> that wouldn't sound good. So I believe I'm a functionalist. <clears throat> well, Maybe I am, but it's, it's long, deep inside me. But uh, I like to start right away uh, with the shape of the building. And that's what gives me a kick, and that's what gives everyone a kick. I charge you to go to a functionalist building that works, a house, let's say, and, and it works just perfectly. But isn't it better to live in the glass house, where you step out the bathroom in rather a strange way, uh, <clears throat> and you, uh, you bring the garbage in and out the front door, you see, what else is wrong with the glass house? But it is a great joy to sit in the middle of the New Canaan uh, landscape in the snow and, and watch the snow change character every five minutes as the sun hits different parts of the, of the drifts. Whoops, I'm going on too long. Over here. I think New York is a nicer place because of the ellipse on Third Avenue. Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Paul Goldberger <laughs> attacked the. Uh, <laughs> Paul Goldberger attacked that building as being, uh, God bless him, I was going to say God rest his soul, that's a funny thing, um, uh, as being completely inappropriate for New York, for not respecting the urban edge. The street line. <clears throat> but I think it's kind of uh, ostentatiousness, it's, a, it's insatiable desire for identity. It's very New York. I mean, I, I think it's, it's an actually an ideal building. The woman, yes. Very good. That's the most important question we've had. What I did, the red, co the red color, for example, came from an old New England barn, right? I mean, New England tobacco barns are that color. The black is merely a charcoal, it's not black anyhow, it's charcoal, uh, sort of a background, disappearing kind of a building. When you stand, and you will someday, because the house is going to be open to the public, uh, and you will see how very fitting that building is into the landscape. You will see that the glass house is a, it's like a bandstand. It stands out there. Look at me. Look at, the, look at the wonderful landscape around you. And any white house in New England is a terribly jarring. Uh, note, I have plenty of white buildings on my place, and they jar. Whereas I claim that the red and black building is the most accommodating, most pleasant to nature of them all. I've got one problem. And that's maybe what you're thinking about. Where are the windows? Um, Helen, uh, <laughs> Helen, um, let me thank Helen and Jennifer and the wife for having us.
first, uh, I probably didn't do that in the beginning as part of the classic technique. But um, I understand that Philip is going to be meeting people personally and signing some autographs and answering some questions one on one in the. Uh, in the exhibition room where the Schubert is. So on that note, I'll invite you to meet him there and thank you for having us. Good night. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.